years ago when Greg Allen first became our worship leader, and I gotta tell you, Greg Allen's one of my favorite people to work with. But Greg, he loves contemporary music. And uh, I thought he was using too much contemporary music and not enough traditional music. And so I wanted to show him in our, <coughs> as a visual for our discussion that most of the people in our church had a taste of music very similar to mine. <laughs> <laughs> and so on Wednesday night, I brought in five tapes of various styles of music. One was liturgical. One was uh, Southern Gospel. One was uh, Gaither. And one was rock. One's contemporary. And I played 30 seconds of each style. And I said to the almost 2,000 people gathered there, now you can only vote for one. Some of you like it all. But I want you to raise your hand when I play this style again, if that is the style that draws you close to God. And I was surprised. I mean, there were some who really drew close to God through rock music. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and there were some who really were warmed by liturgy. But I was also surprised that probably two to one, maybe even higher, raised their hand for contemporary music. And I thought, no, this church is not as spiritually mature. <laughs> but the demonstration that I was bringing for Greg Allen was a demonstration to me. Not everybody likes my style. And that means the majority of our music will be contemporary. But since we have a variety of tastes, uh, let, let, let's have all styles. And I've appreciated uh, your, your singing, your quality, your dignity, your modesty of dress, your sense of importance, your promptness, most of the time. Uh, <laughs> you have served the Lord well. And I thank my God every time I remember you. The second verse it's Philippians 3, 13 and 14. You know what it says. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Dr. Lewis Foster was a professor of mine in seminary I really respected. He said he looked at his life in terms of chapters. The first chapter was study and preparation. The second chapter was ministry. The third chapter was being a professor and education. My next chapter, he said, is not retirement. My next chapter is writing and traveling. But he said, I think it's wise to look at your life in terms of chapters. And when a chapter is over, you close the door and you thank God for it, but you don't live in yesterday's chapter. And life makes changes. And the secret of getting the most out of life is learning to live in the present chapter. You know people, some people are always living in tomorrow's chapter. Starts with little kids. How old are you? Four and a half? <laughs> you know why? They can't wait to be five. Get to five, five and a half. They go to school. Man, I can't wait till this class is over. I wish the weekend we're here. I can't wait till summer. I can't wait till I'm 16 and can drive. I can't wait to go to college and get up. Somebody said, if, if you eliminate all of life, that people wished away, we'd live about a month. I mean, <laughs> now, there does come a time when it reverses itself. I never say, I'm 68 and a half. <laughs> people are living for tomorrow all the time. But even more people live in yesterday's chapter. I went back to my 50th high school reunion uh, a couple years ago, and I think I told you, some of my classmates, at age. <laughs> so much they didn't recognize me. It was... <laughs> but one woman, uh, probably in her 40s, got up to address the graduating class and she said, Kids, enjoy this time because this is the greatest time of your life when you're in high school. I thought, How sad. I enjoyed that period. That wasn't the greatest time of my life greatest time of my life right now. But you know people, don't you? You get with them, they can't stop talking about old high school days or uh, 
uh, the ball game 40, 50 years ago. Uh, Thervalsman, the great sculptor, was asked what his, what his finest statue was. And he said, my next one. <laughs> but I think that ought to be our attitude toward life. Colonel Sanders was 65 and broke when he got his first Social Security check. But he didn't live in yesterday's chapter. He didn't sit around and pine about the good old days of the court of wrestling. He invested that first check in Kentucky Fried, up in KFC. Uh, <laughs> I don't say Kentucky Fried anymore. <laughs> Same grease. It just, it just... <laughs> I think Billy Graham, I think Billy Graham was, was 82 when he preached the crusade here, hundreds came to Christ. <coughs> Caleb in the Bible was 84 when he said to Moses, give me this hill country, I'll take it. I remember Sam Rosenberg telling me, he said, I must be a crazy old man. I'm 91 and I just bought a new trombone. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Junior Wortham sitting down. Here. <laughs> I mean, 98 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Being a school principal is easy. <laughs> I think one of the secrets of making the most of your life is learn to close yesterday's chapter. A lot of things I don't do well. I confess many of those of you are here. But you know something I'm able to do well? I live for today. I mean, I really do. I love being minister of Southeast Christian Church. I've got some great memories, and I love to go back and review that chapter, but there has never been one time, not one time, I've ever driven by this church and said, I wish I was a preacher there. <laughs> I've never sat in a pew with Dave Stone got up to preach and thought, wish that was me. Praise God. <laughs> it's a long chapter. It's a great chapter. I've got wonderful memories of many of you in this in this room, we've gone through a lot of things together. Good, bad. And I thank God every time I remember you. But I mean, I am having the time of my life right now talking to preachers and traveling and preaching. I don't have to write any new talks, I <laughs> Put old titles on old talks. I've never given this talk before under this title. You know? <laughs> I say to the galleons, it's been a really great chat. And uh, come to close. Rejoice over the contribution you made. And I compliment you for your, most of you, for the mature way you, you've responded to that. You've inspired and you've served, deepened relationships. And now it's time to move on to another chat. Don't let yesterday's experiences rob you of today's opportunities. Don't let an attitude of bitterness creep in, rob you of the joy and the vitality of the day. What a good thing to have a final concert, close the chapter, and say, okay, Lord, what's next? Go on and find out ways that you can utilize your gift. Continue to use music. You're going to use it in heaven one day. <laughs> When we all get to heaven, what a day that will be, we'll sing and shout. It's not scripture, but it should be. <laughs> Again, I, I got to praise my wife for doing this. Judy, all her young years, was a musician. I mean, 16, 17 years of piano training. And in the early days of this church, Judy was at the piano, fixture there. But then came a time when they were moving to a different style of music. And, you know, you don't shove the preacher's wife off the end of the piano. <laughs> she sensed the piano bench was getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> As she graciously stepped aside, then 17 years ago she had a stroke. I'm so thankful that she recovered. But she does have a little numbness and couple fingers so she can't play. But I mean, she's accepted that. She went out and bought a player piano. 
uh, <laughs> I mean, she's in photography and scrapbooking and all kinds of other expensive hobbies. <laughs> Thank you.